everyone. This is I-24 News. First, the headlines. Families of captive Israeli soldiers met for the first time with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. An Israeli delegation will travel to Washington to discuss the situation in Rafah. And Saudi Arabia will head the UN Commission for Women's Rights. We'll start off with this. Families of captive Israeli soldiers are meeting for the first time with the Israeli Prime Minister. Soldiers are supposedly at the bottom of the list for exchanges with Hamas. The families want to change that. I-24 News, Balir Sladin is in Tel Aviv now, live with the families. What's new? Yes, uh, well, uh, we are from a hostage square here, and uh, we've heard uh, the uh, comments after the meeting uh, that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, held with the families of the male Israeli soldiers uh, held in captivity in uh, Gaza. And he is saying, and he is assuring them, actually, that uh, Israel uh, will uh, free every single hostage in uh, Gaza, just like it did uh, when it freed 123 so, uh, uh, hostages. Until now, he said that... Uh, Israel is preparing for uh, an invasion of, uh, of Rafah for operation in uh, Rafah, the southern city in Gaza, and he's saying that only with military pressure will there be uh, the uh, uh, possibility of a release of the uh, hostages, including these uh, male soldiers. He's also saying, uh, interestingly, that uh, Israel is holding strategic uh, Hamas assets, as he's saying it. We are not sure what he means by strategic assets uh, belong to Hamas, but a Apparently, uh, he uh, means uh, that uh, uh, the north of Gaza, the military presence there and uh, the military uh, um, occupation of this uh, part of this tribe is, uh, a, 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 uh, of course, a, a strategic asset uh, that Israel holds uh, from uh, Hamas. Maybe that's what he means by uh, strategic assets that belong uh, to Hamas. And uh, for uh, holding that, uh, Israel is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, will, uh, that thing uh, will help Israel. Uh, released the hostages, including the male soldiers. The families themselves uh, earlier today held a press conference in a recruiting office in Tal Hashomer here uh, beside Tel Aviv. Uh, they said that uh, they were silent for 174 days, but they are breaking the silence right now. They are saying that no minister has ever uh, been uh, has ever uh, talked to them uh, during these uh, uh, 174 days, uh, and they're bleeding uh, from uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and they're saying that you have the commitment, uh, the commitment is yours, uh, to uh, free all of the hostages, including our sons from Hamas's uh, captivity. Uh, they, of course, know that uh, uh, this category of male Israeli soldiers is apparently with the, uh, quote unquote, uh, the highest price for Israel. The last time that Israel exchanged an Israeli soldier, uh, it did that a decade ago, Gilad Shalit, for 1,017, uh, 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 excuse me, a Palestinian prisoner from Israel. Israeli jails. Among them was uh, Hamas's leader in Gaza, Yehya Sinwar. So apparently this is the hardest category uh, to be released. Uh, and that's what the families uh, know, of course. And uh, they are demanding from the prime minister uh, to know what Israel is willing to do, which uh, thing Israel is willing to offer in order to uh, 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 release their sons from uh, uh, Hamas's captivity. And the prime minister is assuring them that they are working to release all of them, including the male uh, soldier, as he's saying it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Belir, uh, from Tel Aviv. Here in the studio, uh, Danny Ayalon, ambassador, uh, former Israeli ambassador to Washington. Good evening, Danny. Good evening, Jacob. Uh, well, Prime Minister Netanyahu can offer only words to these families, and they need more. Well, absolutely. Unfortunately, as uh, your reporter um, just advised us, the soldiers, you know, are at, at the end of the list. And they are the ones who probably suffer the most. And uh, the brunt of the Hamas attack was uh, against them and, uh, and their bases, as well as, of course, the communities uh, in, in the south. Um, but I think what uh, we mean by having uh, assets of Hamas is not just uh, our uh, presence in the north of uh, Gaza, but also we have more than a thousand Hamas uh, terrorists. Some of them are very high ranking over there. So we have a lot of assets to be exchanged vis-a-vis -vis the soldiers. And the parents of the soldiers, they're right. They don't want the, uh, the soldiers to be left behind. They would like, if it's possible, to have one you know, grand deal 
everybody for everyone. Right. And I, I spoke actually today uh, with uh, uh, one of the mothers of a soldier that is uh, there, and she, she said, you know, the first round was 50 days into uh, the crisis. It was humanitarian, okay. At this point, everybody is humanitarian. We cannot separate. So that's, that's where they're coming from now. Sure, even if you are a uh, 20 years old with good health after 180 days uh, underground, uh, no, uh, not seeing the light of day, uh, not having proper uh, nutrition, and who knows what else is, uh, are they, they're undergoing. Definitely, everyone is a humanitarian case, and it would be a high time for them to be back home. And I hope also that the international community would realize that, and um, you know, for Hamas to to uh, demand that it will be done in installments, you know, like two, three, or four, it's it's really bad. It's really bad. It's just an assurance for them, I guess. And um, at this point, uh, Jacob, if I were to advise the government, I would say, you know what? We will give you, we'll grant you, Sinwar and everyone else, a safe uh, passage out of Gaza. Lay down your arms and you're free to go and, you know, get some prisoners out and give us back our own hostages. Yeah. The flip side of this is that Hamas is not really talking about any uh, real solution. So that's the other problem. We'll get back to this. Uh, meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu backed down and will send uh, a delegation to the White House. Still, the tensions are far from over. Here's the latest. Victory is within reach. It's a few weeks away. Now we are told, this is it, last point. Now we are told, you can't do this. If you go into Rafah, you're going to have a humanitarian catastrophe. You're going to have, I don't know, 30,000 dead, 30,000, civilian dead. Okay. That's not true. That is simply not true. At the height of the diplomatic crisis with the U.S., Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has once again rejected criticism regarding the IDF's mooted ground operation in Rafah and has even provided a new rationale for the decision to cancel the departure of the delegation to travel to Washington to discuss the operation. My decision not to send the delegation to Washington in the wake of that resolution was a message to Hamas. It was a message, first and foremost, to Hamas, don't bet on this pressure, it's not going to work. Whether Hamas was impressed by the message or not is an open point. After a jingle jangle of denials, the White House confirms that the Israeli delegation will go to Washington after all in order to calm the fear of a humanitarian disaster should the IDF enter southern Gaza. Uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, has agreed, has agreed uh, to reschedule the meeting dedicated to Rafa. So we're, we're uh, now working uh, with them to set, to find a convenient date uh, that's obviously going to work for both sides. But he, his office has agreed uh, to, uh, to reschedule that meeting that would be dedicated uh, to Rafa, which is a good thing. But against the background of this crisis, there is a growing fear in Jerusalem of a domino effect that will damage support from other countries. With the increase of international pressure to end the war in Gaza, the understanding in Jerusalem is also increasing. Israel does not have the time to fight unnecessary battles. So, Daniel, on former ambassador to Washington, what is the state of affairs? Well, it seems like uh, there is no other uh, way to go uh, around uh, the United States, uh, our best friend and ally. Um, and I think Netanyahu was right to uh, back down and send the delegation, uh, because with all due respect to the international community, to UN Security Council and their resolutions, we only have to mind the United States. And um, as so far as we are uh, dependent on the um, the air train, you know, for uh, munitions mostly, uh, we must heed to some of their uh, concerns. And uh, quite frankly, looking at this United Nations uh, Security Council resolution, it wasn't a matter of life and death. And this is what I hear in Washington, that they must use sparingly the veto power. They cannot just do it 
too much because uh, then it isolates the United States. They have wide-ranging interest in other areas of uh, the, the, the world, and they have committed to block any resolution which would damage or hurt Israeli interest. In the case of the last resolution, it wasn't uh, such. And they did call for, they did demand this resolution for the immediate uh, release of the hostages. So um, I would say some more sophistication, more nuanced political, diplomatic approach would have been, well, embrace the resolution. You see what Hamas did. When Israel did not, when Israel rejected the resolution, Hamas embraced it. And then we are the ones who are isolated. So I think Netanyahu did the right thing now, and it's better late than never. What about long-term uh, relationships between Biden and Netanyahu? How can they get along with, in the middle of a war here? Well, this is uh, a good question. However, Jacob, I'm optimistic for one reason, and one reason only, and that is American interest is a strong Israel. Uh, has always been the case. So Israel, uh, America's support to Israel is not just because, I mean, it is, of course, for the values, for sure, but this is not sufficient. Also because of the interest, because a strong Israel can uh, actually bring about stability in the region. Certainly it needs now much more severely than before the 7th of uh, uh, October. So the U.S. will continue to support Israel. Um, I would say, with or without agreements between the two gentlemen in uh, the White House and in Balfour Street in Jerusalem. Okay. Meanwhile, Israel keeps pushing back uh, its threat to invade Rafah with growing skepticism on whether it eventually will. Uh, Haisam Hassanan is with us now uh, to talk about this. Good, good evening to you. Thanks for having me, Jacob. Uh, in your assessment, where are we now um, on the hostage, hostage negotiations uh, between uh, the United States, Qatar, Egypt, Israel, and Hamas? Unfortunately, uh, there is no foreseen uh, progress yet. Uh, the Cairo and Doha, to and Doha talks did not lead to anything. Both um, Egypt and Qatar cannot control Hamas. And instead, Hamas, uh, yesterday, its leaders uh, went to visit uh, Tehran. It was like telling both uh, the Arab mediators, the Egyptians and the Qatars, that they have another uh, regional ally who uh, will give them more options on the negotiation table. Apparently, Hamas seems to care about one thing, survive the current war, declare victory, even if this will come at the expense of Gazan civilians and Israeli hostages. Israeli government claims that Hamas holds Rafah. And the only way to uh, fight it is to go in. Is there any understanding of that in Egypt, in your mind? Uh, at the beginning of the conflict, uh, Cairo didn't believe uh, that Israel could uh, take care uh, or get rid of Hamas. Uh, President Sisi famously said that his government has a, had a track record in dealing with militia groups, and it took years to get rid of them. Over time, this started to change. And we start to see statements coming from President Sisi himself calling from poor demilitarization of uh, Gaza. His foreign minister, Samah Shokri, just a few months ago also responded to former Israeli minister, Tzibi Levine, and he stated that Hamas is out of the Palestinian consensus, which means that Cairo started to see uh, Israel doing progress inside Gaza, and Hamas is weak and irresponsible and has no place at the helm of uh, Palestinian politics anymore. The big challenge for Egypt is uh, uh, they have three fears from any uh, Rafah invasion. One, massive influx of uh, displaced Palestinians into its borders, uh, which brings troubling memories uh, from 2008 when this happened. Uh, such scenario, Egypt foresees that it will force its uh, uh, border security officials to use violence against uh, the infiltrating Palestinians. And this will be very embarrassing for Egypt and the Arab world and internationally. What complicates the situation from the Egyptian perspective when it comes to this point, back in 08, when Palestinians infiltrated the border, it was due to economic boycott. Nowadays, so they basically went in to buy food and supplies and got back. Nowadays, Egypt foresees that there is nothing to do in Gaza and there is nowhere to live. So if they get into Egyptian territories, they wouldn't be going mm. back. Two, Egypt is worried. Palestinian civilian casualties. It doesn't foresee, foresee that any Israeli operation in Rafah uh, without leading to massive casualties. So it worries about. And number three, last point is an Israeli ground presence in Rafah means that more information will be released 
on hidden tunnels and other secrets that led to the massive uh, militarization of Gaza. Obviously, since it came from the Egyptian side of the border, this is likely to be very embarrassing. And this is why Egypt would rather have a ceasefire right away in order to avoid any complications of uh, an mm -hmm. Israeli uh, inside Rafah. Is Egypt committed not to allow Hamas to go back into power in Gaza? Uh, I would argue that, as I argued earlier, at the beginning, this was not the situation because they did not share the belief that uh, the group could uh, be uh, taken out of power or a regime change could happen. But seemingly, as Israel started to progress from one town to another inside Gaza, Egypt started to see that Israel has a strong foothold inside the Strip, and Hamas is not as, as powerful as depicted itself. And you could see that through the official statements that have been coming from Egyptian officials. And uh, warning Israel from intervening, it changed to the demilitarization. Uh, Hamas is out of the political uh, consensus. The Egyptians are trying to find alternative solutions to bring the Palestinian Authority into uh, Gaza. So. Uh, nowadays, I would argue that uh, they started to believe that Hamas uh, cannot be at the helm of Palestinian mm -hmm. politics. All right. Hi, Sam Hassan, and thank you very much for that. Thanks for having me. A Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorist confesses to raping an Israeli woman in a kibbutz during the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. We're talking about Manar Qasim. He was captured by the IDF earlier this month in Khan Yunus. شو كانت لابسه؟ كانت لابسه تنوره فنانه زرقه وبلوزه بيضاء وشبشب ابيض اوكي صندل يعني داير شبشب عملت الحين الشيطان غواني واخذتها هيك نيمتها وشزحتها لهين وعملت اللي عملته هي قاعدة تدد في شوية في حالها ولما بعد ما طول شيء الوضع يعني سمعت في سلاخ برا مع السلاخ في اثنين اجوا شابين ما خدش ذيك في هنا ودقيقة with us now is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi, formerly with IDF. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, together uh, with other testimonies, like the one in the New York Times yesterday, the scope of the sexual attacks is being discovered now. Yes, it was difficult to believe how far are we from this kind of culture that not only cherish death, but also cherish these sexual crimes. And after all this criticism around the world, they uh, deny, try to deny what they had done. But uh, we reveal more and more proof. This is uh, shocking and frightening at the same time. Do you think uh, anything can be done at this stage uh, to alarm public opinion about this? Or this is just too late, all eyes on Gaza, and that's it? it look, in my... Uh, field it is never too late in the field of information uh, there is tons of information that needs to be exposed and uh, as much as we find uh, proofs we will expose them this is highly important to continue to do that 
uh, we are dealing with uh, an industry of lies from the other side. And that's why it's so important not to give up and to continue uh, to expose the truth to all over the world, especially in the UN arena after the United Nations Security Council resolution uh, last week, to make sure that everybody understands what kind of culture we are dealing with. All right, so it's, please stand by. We'll speak about the uh, Hezbollah in a moment. I want to go live to the uh, northern border uh, with I-24 News, Zach Anders, and the latest from there after a couple of very, very uh, busy days there. Today, no different. Uh, we have additional Hezbollah attacks. These taking place like uh, they often do with Aerial launches, Hezbollah claiming that they fired dozens of rockets earlier today. The IDF has not confirmed the amount or the kind of projectiles that were used, but probably the, the most uh, attention-grabbing headline actually came from Safad earlier this afternoon with two Patriot missile interceptions, one of them potentially inter, uh, exploding. Uh, before reaching the target, and the second uh, missile that was sent uh, actually intercepted the target. It, it's not clear the specifics of what happened here, but for those that live in and around Safad, they uh, describe a massive explosion and a very loud rattling noise that could be heard throughout the city as a result of uh, this attempted interception. Safad, a vital access point, of course, because that's the base for Northern Command of the IDF. We have no reports of casualties uh, at this point in the afternoon in Israel. However, in Lebanon, we're seeing these IDF strikes continue to cut very deep into uh, not just Hezbollah territory, but into their rank and file as well. Uh, as many as 16 uh, people uh, unidentified their exact ties, whether they're involved directly with Hezbollah or with other uh, terrorist organizations that operate in the south of Lebanon. But uh, Lebanese media channels reporting in the last 48 hours, as many as 16 have been killed near the border uh, from airstrikes, purported Israeli airstrikes. Of course, the IDF doesn't always confirm their involvement uh, in each individual event. Um, uh, so uh, remarkable in, in the sense that this continues to be this uh, simmering conflict. Uh, but uh, again, th for everyone that is up here in the north, there's still this sense of, of uh, uh, waiting, of, of, of not knowing where this really is, is set to go, because we continue to see the, the, the consistent level of fire taking place on either side um, and, and uh, no real leadership on, on either side, neither within Nasrallah, his circles inside Hezbollah, or within uh, the IDF command structure or the Israeli political structure, giving some sort of timeline of where they see this going and where they see some sort of resolution coming here. It's Again, we're still in this stasis, right. this standstill period. Right. Zach, thank you very much for this report. Back to you, uh, Sarid Zahavi. Uh, this war has been going on for almost half a year, and maybe the bigger stage is yet to come. I don't know. I must uh, tell you that this afternoon, as a mother for me, was very difficult. Uh, I live nine kilometers from the Lebanese border. I am not evacuated, and war is very present here. Uh, I, I was outside uh, in, in the horse riding, and we saw interceptions uh, just uh, a few kilometers away from us. This is insane to raise kids at this kind of atmosphere. And I agree that we don't see the end. Uh, I think that Nasrallah for now is not even interested in negotiating the end because he tied the fire in the north with the fire in the south, and we don't see the end in the south as well. Uh, again, with what is happening with international arena, there is no reason for any of these terrorist organizations to, to uh, work on a ceasefire. They get uh, humanitarian aid, they uh, uh, don't have any pressure on them. Uh, even in Hezbollah, even with Lebanon, even with the fact that there are thousands, tens of thousands evacuated in Lebanon as well, eventually there is no pressure over there to disarm Hezbollah or anything like that. So why would he go for a ceasefire? Even if uh, the Gaza war ends or pauses or something like that, what will be the arrangement in the north that will allow 
thousands of people to get back home. First, I'm very happy that you use the word arrangement rather than the word diplomatic solution because the arrangement as uh, the details were leaked to the media, uh, at least in Lebanese media, don't look like a solution. Uh, again, it, it doesn't speak about a deadline uh, to the withdrawal. The word withdrawal is very problematic because Hezbollah lives in South Lebanon and you cannot uh, take them away from their houses. We should talk about disarmament. Uh, we don't understand what kind of enforcement uh, what kind of effective for enforcement we can talk about since we've seen in the past 17 years that the UN mechanism and 1701 resolution and the Lebanese army, none of these uh, prevented Hezbollah from military deployment uh, in South Lebanon. Uh, so truly, uh, and we don't see the deadline. So without all these terms, I don't see how we are going to feel safe enough uh, to go back to regular lives. And to tell you the truth, I'm very much worried that this is how it's going to end. We will satisfy with the military achievements as they are uh, with the limited activities that IDF is doing now. And uh, IDF published about 4,000 uh, targets that were bombed in Lebanon, which is a very impressive number, but it is clear that once there is a ceasefire, Hezbollah will uh, recover very quickly. And then what? And we will leave it at that. That's a good question. Uh, Sarid Avi, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short break and uh, we'll be right back with more here on i24 News. Stay tuned. Israel is in a state of war. Families completely gunned down in their beds. We have no idea where is she. As our soldiers are fighting on the front lines, but the general perception is something that certainly needs to, to be fought as well. Esta semana en News 24, Israel bajo ataque. News 24 en español trae el análisis y la información de los acontecimientos de la guerra, espadas de hierro. Entrevistas exclusivas, reportes desde la zona de guerra, la reacción de los países hispanoparlantes. News 24, el único medio en español que te mantiene informado y conectado con la comunidad latina en Israel. News 24, únicamente en i24 News.
Welcome back. Intense military activity in the West Bank over the past few uh, weeks, as according to the IDF, there is intelligence of planned terrorist attacks. I-24 News, Robert Swift reports. Today, Israeli medics were called out in the West Bank to attend to vehicles struck by gunfire, not for the first time. Two men received lower limb injuries when the car they were traveling in near the Palestinian city of Jericho was struck by gunfire. Paramedics evacuated a 30-year-old in moderate condition and a 21-year-old with light wounds. A second vehicle, a bus carrying school children, was also attacked with glass fragments injuring a 13-year-old. Israeli forces flooded the Jordan Valley following the shooting, special forces leading a manhunt. It's believed a single gunman was responsible for the attack, with the two adult victims saying they were passing the village of al Uja when the shooting started. While Hamas has attempted to further inflame the West Bank through opening an additional front against Israel, this has not happened, at least not on a large scale. But there have been a number of shootings, including long-range attacks against vehicles. These tend to cause fewer casualties, but give the shooter more opportunity to escape after an attack. In a particularly severe example several days ago, an Israeli soldier was killed and five others wounded in a protracted shootout with a Palestinian gunman. The shooter, armed with a sniper rifle, triggered the engagement by opening fire on Israeli civilian vehicles and was eventually killed by a helicopter strike. I-24 News, Ariel Osiran is here with us in the studio. Ariel, just the other day, uh, Israel captured arms from Iran into the West Bank. What's the plan there? Well, the plan is, it's not necessarily new. The IRGC mainly, um, even Imam Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader, has for over a year um, tried to put the flashlight on, the spotlight on uh, the West Bank as the next arena that should erupt. Obviously, that was trying to avert, divert our attention from from Gaza. But it doesn't mean that their goal for the West Bank is 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 not true or is not as forceful. And what we what you mentioned earlier this week, the Shin Bet managed to thwart. Uh, an Iranian plot that has been ongoing to not only send uh, directions and, and, and instructions to uh, terror operatives in the West Bank to carry out attacks against Israelis, but also sending arms, sending weapons, sending money to uh, support this uh, infrastructure. And so uh, earlier this week, the the IDF and Shin Bet announcing that they uh, managed to dismantle this, this network that was run by Iran. Uh, Iranians uh, also operating from Lebanon. At the end of the day, we see that <clears throat> not only Hamas wants to show uh, uh, the unification of the arenas, the Wahdat al-Sahat, as they say, of all the different arenas, all the different fronts that Israel is uh, presented against active at one time. It's also something that the Iranians want to see all the while trying to avert attention from their own issues that's mm. going on, that are going on there. Ambassador Dani Ailon, uh, could it be that uh, even before the day after problem in Gaza, Israel would have a today problem in the West Bank? Oh, absolutely. You know that uh, it was reported that uh, Khamenei, which is, you know, as we say, you know, in Iran is the head of the snake. So if Iran is the head of the snake, then the head of the head of the snake is Khamenei. And, you know, he is receiving Hania and other Hamas members and Hezbollah, and he has actually, uh, he was telling them that the vulnerable, uh, let's say, uh, soft belly of Israel is from Judea and Samaria, from the West Bank. And hence, we see now all their attempt with uh, smuggling all these arms, quite uh, sophisticated, quite advanced ones. What they would like to do is to replicate Gaza into uh, Judea and Samaria, which would be unsustainable for, for Israel. And um, this could very well be the next front. And I believe that the Judea and Samaria, Jacob, is more dangerous than Gaza and even more than Lebanon.
And, and just yeah. to, to balance off that, today Khamenei uh, hosted in his offices in Tehran the leader of uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Ziad Nakhala, as well as other high-ranking officials. So the, the, the head of the octopus, as, as you could say, is, is working nonstop before October 7th, and you could say even more vigorously since. He's right. trying to focus now on the West Bank, on Judea and Samaria. Meanwhile, Turkey is denying that uh, it is sending weapons to Israel. Dr. Uh, Hai Tanya Archuk is with us. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, could that be? No. Oh. I think it's a fake news. Uh, this Sunday, Turkey will go to the municipal elections. And uh, I also follow the news in Turkish, uh, you know, the Turkish press. Um, and I saw that uh, two newspapers, these are the Karar and the Milli Gazete newspapers, that are both known as Islamist, but at the same time opposition. So uh, they want to undermine uh, Erdogan's anti-Israel election campaign. And this is not a surprise. Now there is a race in Turkey. Who will be more anti-Israel? So uh, when you're reading the news, uh, you can uh, easily understand that they picked the name of the category. Uh, they, I mean, according to the Ministry of uh, Tur according to the Turkish Ministry of Trade, uh, they are talking about uh, lighter fluids. But it is still described under the name of the explosive uh, substances. Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, this is a... So again, Israel is again, part of yeah, internal politics less, yeah, in, uh, yeah. in Turkey. Unfortunately, uh, you know, yeah. if you are uh, making a defamation against Israel, you're using Israel. Unfortunately, you can have this public approval on your side. Again, we are there. Yeah. By the, the way, so, sometimes it works the other way around also in Israel, you know that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it, you know, it's good for both sides, as they say. Uh, by the way, what, what are the prospects for these elections? For these elections, I can tell you my personal opinion, because according to all surveys, you know, we have a very tight uh, rivalry, uh, especially at the capital Ankara and in the most important city, Istanbul. Uh, I assume that in capital Ankara, uh, the opposition mayor, uh, the current mayor, uh, Mansur Yavash, uh, will be victorious. That's what I think. Of course, I may be wrong. Uh, you know, you, you never know. Yeah. And uh, in Istanbul, I think the current uh, mayor, Ekrem Imamoğlu, which is, again, uh, the superstar of the opposition, I assume that he will lose the elections. And uh, I think uh, Murat Kurum, the candidate of the Justice and Development Party, will get it. Um, Erdogan is doing his best uh, together with his ministers. You know, they are using uh, the uh, public treasury's um, sources to uh, to make it uh, more, uh, you know, to For increase his advantages, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. to increase the advantages of Mr. Kurum. But again, we never know. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, the province of Izmir, uh, the stronghold of the Turkish seculars. I, I do not expect any surprises there. Erdogan never won there. But, uh, you know, if he will win there, so this will be the most important headline of these elections. Got it. Uh, remember the Marmara? Uh -huh. uh, the same group <laughs> is planning yeah, to yeah. send another ship to Gaza? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's something to expect, huh? Again, uh, I assume that we should be very cautious because approximately two months ago, uh, I again uh, came across with the same kind of a, a report in the Turkish news, and it didn't happen. I assume that, again, uh, this is something very much connected to the Turkish municipal elections. According to the Turkish news uh, outlets, if such a flotilla will depart from Turkey, uh, it may arrive to the Israeli territorial waters uh, in the second week of April. So we have plenty of time. I assume that after the elections, I want to believe that uh, the Turkish administration will not allow uh, this IHH uh, to launch another flotilla because... But Erdogan promised some help to Gaza, right? Yeah, he uh, he's... Uh, already uh, using this uh, as a trump card in his uh, political campaign. He already dispatched uh, humanitarian aid to Egypt and via Egypt from the uh, Rafah crossing, all of the Turkish aid is already entering to the Gaza Strip and he is using it in a frequent, I mean, he is using it frequently for his own public uh, relations and uh, public approval at home. 
All right. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We've learned more about Turkey. And now, back to you, Ariel Osran. A Russian ship is arriving to the Red Sea to join the party. What's happening? It appears to be the biggest party in, uh, in the world, not just in the Middle East, going on right now in the Red Sea with uh, another superpower sending uh, warships there. The Russian Ministry of Defense announcing today that a, a cruise missile ship as well as another frigate have entered the Bab el-Mandab Strait and uh, arrived at the Red Sea. Now, the timing is interesting because it was just last week that there was uh, there were reports that the Russians and Chinese received security guarantees from the Houthis that their ships will be safe, that they won't be targeted. Right. And uh, on Friday, the Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov was asked about this. Let's take a listen uh, to what his response was to this question. Bloomberg said that якобы хуси то заверили Россию и Китай, что не будут атаковать их суда в Красном море. Правда ли Россия такие заверения получала? Известно, что об этом Кремлю. Нет, ничего не известно, ничего не могу сказать на эту тему. And not only the Red Sea. Not only the Red Sea, we're seeing the encroachment of uh, Russian forces along Israel's volatile fronts, also on the Israel-Syria border. In recent months, we've seen increased Russian activity in building observation posts along the border. So far since the start of the year, they've built 10 of these observation posts, and 11th is expected to be inaugurated soon. And this raises big questions as to this shift that we've seen uh, in Russian policy regarding the Middle East since October 7th, but specifically regarding Israel. I think there's two explanations to Russians, uh, Russia's latest activity. One, regarding the the Red Sea. This is, as we, as, as you said, the biggest party in the world. They have to throw their hat in to be relevant. I mean, even the Netherlands announced that they sent a ship today. How can Russia not be part of it? Uh, it's a message to uh, the Americans and the British that their con that the Russian condemnations for their strikes against the Houthis are not going to end only in words, and they're sending their military assets to the region. I think that is a very interesting and I think even a uh, alarming development going on there. The second message, I think, is aimed at Jerusalem. Uh, Russia does not like, uh, is, is not favored Israeli, um, at least statements regarding Russian policy since October 7th, also since uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, Israel has been kind of tiptoeing, but I think the bolstering presence on the on a volatile border, indeed yeah. sends a clear message to Israel. Let's see if Israeli leaders will heed that message, which should be heeded on the other side of perhaps reassessing Israel's strategic relations right. with Russia, given these changes. How do you see this, Ambassador Ayalon? Well, I, I would say, Jaco, that, that could be hilarious if Russian ships are being ha you know, hit by the Houthis. <laughs> uh, also, I would say that I don't think that the Russians have too many ships, warships to spare, uh, after the Ukrainians take them one by one. So uh, it's, it's more kind of a bravado, a trying to uh, show a force, but I'm not sure there is much behind it. We saw the uh, achievements, quote unquote, of the uh, Russian military in the Ukraine, and uh, they are not uh, anything uh, that uh, should be desired. So um, at this point, I think the, the, the Russians are just trying to save face. And as Ariel said, you know, if the U.S. is there, if NATO is there, Russia has to show that they are still one of the world powers, even though they're not. And there are many who will tell you that Russia basically is a third uh, world country, but with one of the largest nuclear arsenals. All right, Ambassador Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, Ariel Osaran, I appreciate an update. There's breaking news about the Israeli Supreme Court and the draft of the Haredi population. Uh, we'll uh, get back to this in a few minutes. But now, uh, an Iranian court has sentenced a uh, police chief in northern Iran to death after he was charged with killing a man during the protests in 2022. We have uh, Kamelia Andekabifard with us, editor-in-chief of Independent Persian. Thank you very much for joining us. Also, may I say happy Persian New Year? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, dear Jacob. Good to be with you, and thanks for the Noruz greeting. Thank you. Noruz. Uh, is there any message hidden here in this move by the regime, by the courts? 
Um, you, you hinted a correct word. You said a police officer has been charged uh, for killing uh, civilian protesters. Um, it means they want to more get engaged uh, the people who has been killed by the police department, by the people who are officially are around to be protect the civilians, not the revolutionary guards. At uh, two years ago, the demonstration, we had massively more of the police forces and also uh, civilian clothes, armed uh, individuals. Still, we don't know who were those people with the civilian clothes. None of them arrested. We don't know if they were the revolutionary guards. They asked to wear a dif different set of the clothes or they were besieged with besieges under the revolutionary guards acting as the second degree forces. Uh, they, they try to build this uh, intention to the public that um, the police were in charge of killing the people and singularizing that individual one, having a court for um, him, it's um, also a little uh, um, funny. 550 people killed and just um, opening a file of one of those people rather and, and how about another 550 people, especially Mahsa Amini. Iranian still are so much demanding um, an investigation about her death in the custody um, of the authority and uh, just uh, eliminating about Mahsa and the other incidents of the people killed at the demonstration, it doesn't make sense to the Iranians. Mm. Uh, which brings me to the state of affairs now in, in Iran. How would you characterize the status of the civilian unrest at this stage? Um, in Iran, Iranians are not uh, the, the, have this fashion to continuously pursue a particular things. Even if you see the pre-revolution time, it takes at least 10 years than the revolution happened. And sometimes it has its own peak and again they get some time um, in, in they get quiet again. And I can see that uh, among of the Iranians too. In the past 45 years ago, from small demonstrations start to build to become bigger and bigger. And the two years ago was the most biggest one. It's very quiet now, but um, the flame of the demonstration and anger and frustration can burn at any days. I believe this summer, it's the hot summer in Iranian politics. Um, there were certain changes happened during the last two elections uh, before our new year, early March. And then they were expecting to see the result of this um, um, these elections, which it was so much in the favor of the conservatives close to the revolutionary guards and close to the supreme leader. Perhaps uh, the changes in the supreme leadership in Iran is next, and also to be hearing more about their political engagement with the West and in the United States. Uh, perhaps uh, the Iranian would wait for another momentum, depends on what the regime wants to do next step, to have or repre or to introduce the next supreme leader and also getting to the presidential election within year and a half. Okay, Camelia, thank you very much. Thank you. As we said, we have a very interesting breaking story in Israel, a landmark decision by the Supreme Court that may affect the future of uh, the government. Ariel Osiran with more details here. Yeah, we're talking about a dramatic 11th hour interim order. We have to say this isn't a final decision by the Supreme Court, basically stating that uh, the Israeli government must freeze all funding to Israeli, uh, to Jewish yeshivas, um, ultra-Orthodox um, institutions of education. Uh, if the, the students who are required to, uh, to get drafted to, to go to the military, if they don't do that, meaning if there's a Haredi institution that doesn't send its students that are supposed to go to the army to the army, they will be revoked of their uh, government funding. This is a political bombshell. The, there's the Israeli war cabinet that was supposed to convene and was postponed to an unknown uh, time. There's even talks that it was because of this decision and the political um, reality in Israel dictating the situation. I will say that if there's one thing that is proven to take down governments in Israel, it's not wars, it's not COVID, it's this draft law. This is the is what is perhaps the biggest political hot potato. And the Supreme Court with this interim order 
really uh, putting the ball in the government's court. And uh, Neten uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has some uh, difficult decisions to make regarding the uh, future of his either of his government and uh, political uh, the future of his political uh, cooperation with the Haredis or to adhere to this right. uh, interim order. All right, this is a developing story. Please stand by, and uh, we'll see if there are other developments. Meanwhile, to uh, Dubai to talk about this, Saudi Arabia. Um, has been chosen as the chair of the UN Commission that is supposed to uh, promote gender equality and empower women around the world. No less. Bastian Bari in Dubai. Uh, this is somewhat challenging, let's put it this way, right? And surprising, for sure. At least, at least it wasn't a big challenge for um, Saudi Arabia, Jacob, as the Saudi ambassador to the UN, um, Abdulaziz al Wasil, was elected as chair of this, uh, this commission on the status of women by acclamation, uh, as there, was, uh, there were no rival candidates, basically, and, and no dissent, uh, at least at this uh, CSW's annual meeting in, uh, in New York yesterday. Um, when the Filipino envoy to the UN, who was the outgoing chair, um, asked if uh, the members if they had any objections, there was silence in the chamber, basically. Um, besides, normally a country holds the chair for two years, but the Philippines was put under pressure from um, other members of the uh, uh, Asia group to split its tenure and pass the post on to another country after one year. Um, initially, Bangladesh was expected to take over, but late in the process, uh, Saudi Arabia sort of stepped in and, and lobbied for the, for the chair. Now we are seeing human rights organizations opposing this. Uh, I mean, if the, the reactions of um, uh, re human rights organizations such as uh, Amnesty International are anything to go by, uh, yes, this could be seen as an attempt to burnish uh, the kingdom's image. Um, speaking of um, Amnesty, um, um, the organization quickly pointed to the irony of the CSW being led by a country in which the gap be between men's and women's rights um, even on paper, uh, is so wide. Also saying that whoever is in the chair uh, is, a, is in a key position to influence the planning, the decisions, the taking stock, etc. And that Saudi Arabia's own record of, um, on women's rights is, uh, uh, quote, abysmal and, and a far cry from the mandate of the, of the commission. And for its part, um, Human Rights Roach is, is saying that the country um, that jails women simply because they advocate for their rights has no business being the face of um, you, the UN's top forum, let's say, for women's rights and gender equality. Uh, the group even tried to lobby other countries among the current CSW members, uh, including um, states like the Netherlands, Japan, Switzerland, etc. But everyone reportedly kept secret, uh, kept yeah. quiet, sorry. Yeah. Well, there has been some progress in Saudi Arabia uh, regarding women's rights. Uh, who knows? Maybe um, you know, this will uh, make things better there. So I'm just speculating. I mean, in stories like this, there are always, there are always uh, three ways of looking at things. The first one is to consider that countries like these need to be integrated so as not to be uh, isolated and leave them... Uh, uh, and not leave them to continue with, a, uh, in this case, a patriarchal system. The second one is, uh, on the contrary, to isolate them and force them to change. And the third one is to let them use their lobbying skills and say that, you know, it's okay, the situation regarding women in, in countries like Saudi Arabia is not so bad. And it's safe to say that the United, Nat United Nations does a bit of all three, uh, if you will, uh, to the liking of, uh, of Riyadh. All right, Bastien Barry in Dubai. Thank you very much. Now this, uh, scientists at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel uh, were lucky enough to spot the early stages of a supernova explosion. This is very rare, and it was by chance. I-24 News, Dixie Arvind has the story. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a large star exploded 20 million years ago, to be exact. The explosion dispersed remnants through space. Over a year ago, the light emitted from the explosion reached Earth. Israeli scientists at the Wiseman Institute were the first to observe the earliest stages of the explosion. So that night, on the Friday night, after we realized that this is a super interesting and very rare opportunity, we pulled the trigger. We told NASA, this is the time. Stop whatever it is you're doing. Hubble stopped whatever it was doing 
and turned as quickly as it can to observe our target. And he did it. It was the fastest ever observations of this type that, not, that Hubble did. The star that exploded was located in a neighboring galaxy called Messier 101, and scientists predict that the explosion probably left behind a massive black hole. To understand this, we have to study the star itself be, as it was before the explosion. And this, these measurements that we got so quickly after the explosion allowed us to recover this information before it was totally lost. So one of the interesting results from this paper, for example, is that we suspect that after the explosion, the, a black hole was left behind. Such occurrences are quite rare, and the explosion creates a sort of fingerprint of the supernova and the elements it leaves behind. Scientists can now study the early stages of an ultraviolet light from such an explosion, which can help find supernovas elsewhere in space. This was the first opportunity we had to observe the, the, this explosion process, this, this light escaping for the first time from the area around the star, and that gave us new information about several things. One, we can estimate the properties both of the star and of the material around it as they were before the explosion. In the chaos of cosmic creation, scientists witness a spectacle which will move through space for eons. And this is it for us. Stay tuned for more news with Kalev Ben David here on I-24 News. Have a good night from Tel Aviv. Israel is in a state of war. Families completely gunned down in their beds. We have no idea where is she. As our soldiers are fighting on the front lines, but the general perception is something that certainly needs to, to be fought as well. Esta semana en News 24, Israel bajo ataque. 
News 24 en Español trae el análisis y la información de los acontecimientos de la guerra Espadas de Hierro. Entrevistas exclusivas, reportes desde la zona de guerra, la reacción de los países hispanoparlantes. News 24, el único medio en español que te mantiene informado y conectado con la comunidad latina en Israel. News 24, únicamente en i24 News. Welcome to the special edition of I-24 News. I'm Caleb Ben David. It is day 174 of Israel's war against Hamas, making it nearly six months that 134 hostages have been held captive in Gaza. Now, with negotiations seemingly deadlocked over a deal that would free some of them, Israel's uh, security cabinet is set to meet this evening over how to proceed from here. Earlier today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu began a meeting in his office with representatives from some of the hostage families. Before heading into that discussion, some of the family members staged a protest outside the Army Recruiting Center in the town of Kiryat Ono. Here's what Daniel Nutra, whose brother Omer is held hostage in Gaza, had to say there. In our meeting, we want to know what the plan is to bring them home, and we want to demand their immediate release now from the prime minister. It's been too long, and I need my brother back. And joining us in the studio for more is Daniel Sheck, director of diplomacy for the Hostage and Missing Families Forum and the former Israeli ambassador to France. We have Ariel Oseran, our Middle East correspondent, and Raphael Yerushalmi, former senior intelligence officer in the IDF. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, let me first start with you. Uh, the, uh, the significance of this meeting today uh, between Prime Minister Netanyahu and the hostage families, and uh, 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 of course, the significance of the timing especially. Well, uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, say something that may sound uh, unbelievable, but this is the first time the Prime Minister has met, will have met with the parents of the uh, captured soldiers. Um, as a group. Right. It's sort of an unspoken uh, truth uh, in the building, in the uh, forum of uh, families of hostages, that uh, the soldiers, especially the male soldiers, uh, are sort of the last group that uh, can hope to be uh, released. To be released. If, if at all. Uh, if at all, and who knows, you know, some right. people think that it may take uh, far too long. So uh, this is a group of parents that has, uh, you know, on top of the regular, quote unquote, distress that everyone has, uh, th this is uh, one step uh, above all, all the others. So I know that uh, uh, they 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 consider this meeting as a big deal. It's uh, they prepared for it uh, as a group. I, uh, I uh, incidentally I spoke about it with the uh, uh, Ronen Neutra, the the father of uh, of the two brothers, and um, 
uh, they they want to hear if there is uh, a plan, if mm. in the negotiations this comes up at all, and in what way, and what is the strategy, even if they understand that it's not necessarily realistic to expect uh, these uh, hostages to be released in the first group. Right. They want uh, uh, the, the negotiation to uh, propose a strategy that will end with the release of the very last hostage, even if it takes time. Right. That is, uh, that is their expectation, and they want to hear from the prime minister if that is also the strategy of the negotiators. All right. Prime Minister Netanyahu did release a statement afterwards ex yes. expressing his sympathy, identification, and that he certainly knows about the uh, situation uh, uh, of that. We'll have to see after the meeting what statement yeah, comes out. There will out. be a statement by the families too, but it's not right. out yet. All right. Well, uh, let's speaking of the ordeal, certainly that some of the hostages, are, they're all going through an ordeal. Special concern about the female hostages, we should say. Uh, this, of course, just days after the former hostage Amit Susana went public with her account of suffering sexual assault at the hands of her Hamas guard while in captivity, while the IDF today releasing footage from the interrogation of a captured Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorist uh, caught in Gaza in the Khan Yunus area, Manar Mahmoud Mohammed Qasem, confessing how he took part in the rape and murder of an Israeli woman during the October 7th attack. Let's take a look at some of that. <laughs> فتحت عادة الباب ما فيش صوت حدد رحت دخلت في غرفة هيك اتفاجأت في بنت اتفاجأت في بنت اوكي اه سيدة بتقول ساعدني من هيك هنا حطيت رميتها على ايش على الكنبة البنت ايش شكلها؟ شعرها مش طويل كثير عادي يعني ووجهها ملامح ورفيعة وهي رفيعة وفي في رقبتها سنسال وجوهرة وزي هيك انا يعني كانت لابسه تنور شو كانت لابسه؟ كانت لابسه تنورة تنورة زرقاء وبلوزة بيضاء وشبشب ابيض اوكي صندل يعني لا يعني عملت الحين الشيطان غواني وأخذتها هيك نيمتها وشزحتها لهين وعملت إذا عملته نمت معها هي قاعدة تدد في شوية في حالها ولما بعد ما طولش الوضع يعني سمعت فيه سراخ برا مع السلاح في اثنين اجوا وشابين. ما خدش دقيقتين او دقيقه ونص. ما لحقناش في اثنين شباب دخلوا من الباب قوه اه الا صوت السلاح الحجه. مش عارف هي امها ولا مين هي. شو مين؟ البنت فقلت لابس زهري. زهري زهري. الكلسون زهري والصدر زهري. اه وبعديها الحين احنا لما سمعنا صراخ وقت هي قاعده تلبس وانا قاعد بلبس يعني التمسنا ولا بدخلت الشباب هذول. ما عليهم كتاب شو ده اتصل وانا ضل عمودي. وجايز امهم كمان لانهم شدوا امها ودخلوها عندنا جنبها يعني. صاروا يوصف بعض البنت والام يعني تحليل انا صارت يوصفها المهم بعد شوي انا ضليتني في الغرفه اللي هم ماخذين البنت والمراه وطالعين على الفيسبوك اخذوها وانا ضليتني ايش لابت في الغرفه The devil took him with the heart to watch that Raphael we heard the not we've heard those denials of people that this didn't happen. Others say, oh, it was civilians that didn't. There we have it there, a, uh, a terrorist from the PIJ uh, admitting and going into great detail about the rape of uh, this uh, woman uh, there on October 7th. Of course, and uh, it took a little while because of the conditions of some of the corpses of the massacres that of 7th of October, but uh, we have now all... 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, the analysis, uh, medical analysis that prove how many uh, people were actually tortured and raped during those massacres. Uh, this is now a, a legal medical uh, uh, proof that is uh, in the files. Uh, we also know, and uh, people should remember, that uh, uh, this horrible uh, use of uh, raping is, of course, first the women, but it includes the men. Includes the men. The men were raped and men were sexually assaulted and mutilated as well. Uh, and we should also remember that the Hamas has practiced this kind of rapes and mutilation on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip during the rule that they had in the Gaza Strip. These people, that's how they function, that's how they think. They don't even think, they just don't think twice about it. They will rape you, they will mutilate you. And in their uh, perspective, uh, sexual mutilation, sexual elements are very symbolic of their power over you. Uh, they know that it will humiliate the victim even more. Uh, it's all calculated. It's all uh, in a very emblematic way as well as the pure animal uh, instinct uh, that they, they show. All right. Uh, we're going to come back to the issue of the hostages. And, of course, we're waiting to see if there's something that comes out of the meeting. I just want to move on a bit uh, to uh, northern Israel. Uh, it's just a day now after Zahir Bashara was killed by a rocket launch from southern Lebanon at uh, the town of Kirch Shmona. Today, Hezbollah continued its aerial attacks into northern Israel, damaging a home in the town of Shlomi, starting a fire in the community of Khanita. For more, let's go to Zach Ganders, our correspondent in northern Israel. And Zach, just bring us up to date on the situation, especially these attacks in the last few hours. Yeah, we've been play, paying close attention to the border tonight, considering the amount of activity that has taken place in the last several days. Hezbollah taking credit for six attacks at this point into the night. There are no reports of casualties on the Israeli side. However, some damage, uh, some uh, light damage, uh, it would be categorized in uh, Shlomi, as you mentioned, from earlier attacks. We also see in a couple of places that fires have started today as a result of the falling debris from both the interceptions and from rockets that apparently just fell into the hillside without an interception. It was a very hot day today, and it's expected to get hotter. So that's now a concern that's entering into this, uh, the, the different factors that are at play here. The IDF continuing to strike positions throughout southern Lebanon. We see uh, several communities near the border on Lebanese media channels have been hit. There's uh, no significant reports coming out of Hezbollah themselves regarding any uh, casualties or losses on their end. However, the reports coming out of Beirut suggest that once again today there are casualties uh, related to these strikes. Hezbollah absolutely incensed over the last several days on their uh, social media channels, many of the members of the party officials taking to social media, tweeting in Arabic uh, about their anger and frustration over IDF strikes that uh, uh, killed uh, several men in, in border communities, Hezbollah claiming that they were uh, ambulance uh, paramedic drivers and, and uh, related to uh, their wing of uh, uh, the emergency services. That can't be independently verified. Um, and these are the reports, of course, that are stemming and originated from Hezbollah's claims themselves. Um, so the, the tense moments that are, are playing out along this northern border in the last few days uh, continue to uh, underscore that this is a very volatile situation. We still have not seen a, 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 a serious escalation in terms of massive saturation attacks or an attempt to launch farther uh, than uh, uh, Hezbollah has done before. Uh, of course, that could change, keeping an eye on things here uh, as the night continues. Okay, Zach Anders in northern Israel, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and Ariel, some reports also coming out of uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, pointing to a uh, player uh, sort of raising his profile a little, uh, something that could conceivably concern Israel for sure. Yeah, well, we're talking about the Russians uh, increasing their presence along the border, the Israel-Syria border. Right. Over the past few months, they've increased their presence there with since the start of the year. They've established at least 10 observation posts along Israel's border with Syria and the Golan Heights. That's a pretty significant number, which raises the question, 
Uh, what is Israel doing about this? How is this affecting the strategic relations between Jerusalem and Moscow? The 11th observation post is expected to be inaugurated soon. And I think we, if, if, if we look at what Russia is trying to achieve here, I think we need to, first of all, look at the context of Israel-Russia relations, that they've uh, taken a hit since October 7th with Russia hosting Hamas d delegations and really Russia positioning itself in the side of the Iranian axis. But if we also look at what Russia is really uh, one of its greater strategic uh, goals, that's to show that they're still relevant. That's They see that there's a volatile border that could erupt at any moment and their increased presence there will uh, improve their starting position uh, regarding trying to play an influential role, because that's at the end of the well, day. Well, let's talk about the increasing Russians their presence, trying. because a pretty dramatic announcement coming uh, from the Russians today about a, a different theater of this, <laughs> let's say, larger scale conflict, uh, and that is involving, of course, the Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. Look, if we're talking about an encroachment by the Russians on one of Israel's uh, boiling fronts, they're also heating up the temperature in the south with uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense announcing today that a cruise missile warship, as well, in addition to another frigate, have entered the Red Sea through the Bab el Mandab Strait. That would make the Red Sea the biggest party in the Middle East, if not the world right now, because you have uh, American, British, a whole international coalition of naval forces uh, present in the Red Sea, in addition to Iranian forces and now Russians. And so this uh, is, is really getting a, a, a little tight. In, in the Red Sea, and with more and more actors, it raises the possibility of, of some sort of eruption there, any miscalculation. This obviously a message to the West that the w statements condemning uh, American and British attacks against the Yemen, against the Houthis in Yemen, are not going to just be limited to words, but now also going into action. It's going to be very interesting to see how this reality in the Red Sea plays out. All right. Uh, well, let's move now uh, back to Israel and uh, take a look uh, at the West Bank, where vehicles traveling there uh, today were fired upon. Three people wounded in today's attack, including a 13-year-old boy. That's after bullets were fired at cars and school buses traveling along Route 90 in the Jordan Valley. The terrorists remain at large as Israeli security forces are conducting a manhunt in the area. More in this report from Robert Swift. Today, Israeli medics were called out in the West Bank to attend to vehicles struck by gunfire, not for the first time. Two men received lower limb injuries when the car they were traveling in near the Palestinian city of Jericho was struck by gunfire. Paramedics evacuated a 30-year-old in moderate condition and a 21-year-old with light wounds. A second vehicle, a bus carrying school children, was also attacked, with glass fragments injuring a 13-year-old. Israeli forces flooded the Jordan Valley following the shooting, special forces leading a manhunt. It's believed a single gunman was responsible for the attack, with the two adult victims saying they were passing the village of al Uja when the shooting started. While Hamas has attempted to further inflame the West Bank through opening an additional front against Israel, this has not happened, at least not on a large scale. But there have been a number of shootings, including long-range attacks against vehicles. These tend to cause fewer casualties, but give the shooter more opportunity to escape after an attack. In a particularly severe example several days ago, an Israeli soldier was killed and five other... We're going now to briefing from the IDF spokesperson, Daniel Hagari. In recent hours, we received uh, a confirmation by the Shin Bet of the elimination of a high-ranking Hamas official, Rai Tabet, in uh, the Shifa hospital. He was responsible for the logistics and, uh, and manpower of uh, Hamas. He's considered a source of knowledge, of know-how, and also of... Uh, 
uh, armament of Hamas. He's considered one of the top ten officials in uh, Hamas's military wing. He is connected to Yechia Sinwar and Marwan Issa, leaders of Hamas in Gaza. He was eliminated in addition to two. Uh, he was eliminated in addition to two other terrorists in Shifa Hospital who were approaching our forces. They were eliminated by Israeli Shayat at 13 Special Navy Commando forces as well as Shaked and Duvdevan special units. In another area of Shifa Hospital, in the maternity ward, there's Nachal special forces that have uh, searched the area, identified three terrorists. There was an ensuing chase, there was a firefight, and the three terrorists were eliminated. We're still looking into their identity, and we will share their, the information once we have it all. The determination of Shin Bet and IDF forces to operate in Shifa Hospital based on uh, pinpoint intelligence has proven itself. We have reached senior officials, and we will reach additional officials, senior officials. Yesterday, during interrogation uh, taking place in Shifa Hospital, we interrogated Interrogated a Hamas terrorist, and he led us to a spot where long range missiles were uh, placed. Israeli forces, IDF forces, identified the launchers and destroyed them. In Shifa hospital, there were 1,250 1, people when we cordoned the area. There are currently 350. Uh, patients and medical staff there, out of the, in addition to at least 900 Hamas and terror and PIJ terror suspects. We are continue to investigate and we will identify additional senior officials in the hospital. We will reach them all. Hamas is destroying the hospital, responsible for its destruction. F fights from within the departments is uh, hurting the different uh, wards and the hospital is damaged as a result of Hamas activity. IDF forces in Khan Yunus area operating in the Al Amal neighborhood. So far, IDF forces have arrested dozens of terrorists and covered un uh, underground tunnels and uh, uncovering weapons caches that have been uh, following intelligence by Shin Bet and IDF. Overnight, Israeli forces D destroyed an uh, underground tunnel of uh, about just over one, one half miles long that connected north and south Gaza. During the fighting in the Gaza Strip, this tunnel has been in, used by the terrorists and we destroyed it with over 30 tons of explosives. In the Jordan Valley, in the early morning hours, a terrorist opened fire towards Israeli vehicles, including a student uh, bus. As a result of the fire of the shooting, three Israelis were injured, including a 13-year-old. Israeli forces opened a manhunt, launched a manhunt to find a terrorist. We are going to continue to hunt him down until we find him. Following a situation assessment, uh, different checkpoints have been set up to prevent the disappearance of the terrorist. We are spread out. Uh, thoroughly during the month of Ramadan. We are acting to thwart terror, also in recent days, also moving forward, and we will continue to do that in the north. We continue to bolster our readiness of all IDF preparations. Today we conducted a drill that uh, tests all the different scenarios of a war in the northern front, and that's aimed at improving our readiness in the north. Simultaneously in the recent days, specifically over the last night, Israeli fighter jets are striking all across Lebanon, striking targets belonging to Hezbollah, including significant terror infrastructure. Over the 48 hours, we eliminated at least 16 terrorists in Lebanon, 30 over the last week. That's just one example of our extensive activity in the north. We are going to thwart anyone who tries to hurt us, uh, thwarts any terror attack 
or any terrorism that tries to uh, raise its head on the border and pushes away uh, Hamas uh, Hezbollah fighters. A message to the residents of the north. This is a difficult period. Despite that, you are showing uh, unwavering uh, courage and strength. We will continue to uh, fight against Hezbollah while using, utilizing many reservists that will help us act forcefully against Hezbollah. We will do anything that we can, everything that we can to ensure a safe reality and the safe return of the residents of the North. Since the start of the war, the IDF is acting to uh, gather forensic information aimed at showing the world the scope of the atrocities that Hamas carried out on October 7th. We are working with the Israeli police to uh, gather a significant database of information to prove Hamas's atrocities. This is a very difficult task, but it is our. This is we we are forced to do it. We must do it. Part of our obligation to the Israeli people to tell the story of what happened to the Israelis, also those whose voice will no longer be heard. Today we exposed uh, difficult uh, footage of uh, interrogation of a Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorist from their naval forces of the PIJ that took part in the October 7th onslaught. Qasem, the terrorist, acknowledged in his own voice how he raped an Israeli woman, how he brutally raped her, and how he shot later shot an Israeli civilian. We will continue to share and tell the world the crimes against humanity that Hamas carried out and how it carried out atrocities similar likening to, die, to ISIS against Israeli people to prove that this is a just war that the Israeli people are fighting. We are continuing to gather more and more evidence that prove the scope of the atrocities of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. In Gaza, 134 hostages are still being held. We are very concerned for their physical and mental well-being. We'll continue to act in all avenues, uh, operational, intelligence, and everything that will better the conditions to bring them back. Questions? All right, that was uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagar, the IDF spokesperson, covering a number of topics, including the fighting, uh, continuing fighting in Gaza uh, in Iraq Shifa Hospital, the elimination of a senior Hamas uh, uh, terrorist in that operation. He also discussed the attacks in the north, uh, the footage that we showed earlier, uh, the interrogation of a, a Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorist who committed uh, an act of rape, admitting to committing rape on October 7th of an Israeli woman, and uh, mentioning that uh, terror attack today in the Jordan Valley. And Rafael, he mentioned the manhunt on for the suspect. There is a suspect. And uh, uh, again, the identity of the suspect raising some uh, problematic issues. Well, on the day that the Americans revealed that they were thinking of uh, establishing a Palestinian security force in the Gaza Strip uh, on the day after, uh, we see the problematic uh, uh, position of uh, many of the security people uh, of the Palestinian autonomy, which most of them belong to the PLO, uh, but some of them, unfortunately, uh, are not uh, helping uh, Israel to fight terrorism. They are terrorists themselves. That's, that's the problematic. Uh, what is uh, new in the modus operandi of uh, today's uh, act, action and uh, a couple of days ago also is that you're talking about a lone sniper. So it's not a lone wolf. It's a very trained and very well equipped uh, uh, terrorist, not, not such, just a civilian going out uh, on a spree with a knife or a pair of scissors, but somebody who is belonging to security forces, who is well equipped, uh, who knows how to operate as a sniper, who can shoot from a distance or attack with a, a long range gun and uh, then escape uh, very easily, meaning they um, have prepared in both cases and today as well. Uh, their escape route. 
And this seems to be a new trend because a lot of uh, the other modus operandi have uh, failed or have been thwarted of late because uh, the IDF, of course, learns from all the different cases. So uh, the terrorists are trying to innovate. In this particular case, because of the footage, uh, the, the, the culprit could be identified. But so far, uh, it, it's a manhunt uh, uh, going on to catch it. Right, and of course, we just recently had another terror attack where there was a uh, former member or, or a member of the Palestinian security yeah. forces uh, that was involved. It's uh, going to bring, in uh, I think, copycat reactions, unfortunately. Right, and you mentioned, of course, uh, yes, no, please. No, I, I think this is already a copycat attack of October 7th because to have someone in military uniform shooting vehicles in an open road in broad daylight, that's exactly what happened on Route 232 in October 7th. And the fact that there's a uh, Palestinian security apparatus officer who obviously has seen the footage, right. it wouldn't be surprising if that is indeed was indeed the intent right. to have a copycat attack inspired by the October 7th right. onslaught. Now, you mentioned the U.S. role in trying to set up a reform, so-called reform Palestinian Authority uh, security forces. The role of the Palestinian Authority is one of the tensions, the current tensions, uh, between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government over the future course of both uh, the Gaza war and the day after in Gaza. This, of course, has sparked uh, the most serious crisis between the Israel and the U.S. in years. Now, the latest skirmish between Washington and Jerusalem is sort of a battle of versions over uh, the willingness of Israel to send a delegation to the White House to discuss the planned military operation in Rafah. A guy, Azriel, has more over this potential impact of this breach between the close allies. Victory is within reach. It's a few weeks away. Now we are told, this is it, last point. Now we are told, you can't do this. If you go into Rafah, you're going to have a humanitarian catastrophe. You're going to have, I don't know, 30,000 dead, 30,000, civilian dead. Okay. That's not true. That is simply not true. At the height of the diplomatic crisis with the U.S., Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has once again rejected criticism regarding the IDF's muted ground operation in Rafah and has even provided a new rationale for the decision to cancel the departure of the delegation to travel to Washington to discuss the operation. My decision not to send the delegation to Washington in the wake of that resolution was a message to Hamas. It was a message first and foremost to Hamas, don't bet on this pressure, it's not going to work. Whether Hamas was impressed by the message or not is an open point. After a jingle jangle of denials, the White House confirms that the Israeli delegation will go to Washington after all in order to calm the fear of a humanitarian disaster should the IDF enter southern Gaza. Uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, has agreed, has agreed uh, to reschedule the meeting dedicated to Rafa. So we're, we're uh, now working uh, with them to set, to find a convenient date uh, that's obviously going to work for both sides. But he, his office has agreed uh, to, uh, to reschedule that meeting that would be dedicated uh, to Rafa, which is a good thing. But against the background of this crisis, there is a growing fear in Jerusalem of a domino effect that will damage support from other countries. With the increase of international pressure to end the war in Gaza, the understanding in Jerusalem is also increasing. Israel does not have the time to fight unnecessary battles. Well, for more, we're now joined by Danny Danone, uh, now a member of Knesset for the Likud Party and, of course, the former Israeli ambassador to the U.N. He's speaking to us from Tel Aviv. Danny, thank you for joining us. And let's talk about uh, Israel-U.S. relations. Now, supposedly, uh, Ron Dermer uh, will be going uh, uh, with Sachi Nagbi to Washington. What should the message should be there? And is the U.S., is Israel going to be able to get the U.S. on the same page when it comes towards its intention to carry out to finish the job and carry out an operation in Rafa? We have no other choice, Caleb. You know, we, we appreciate the bond between Israel and the U.S. We are grateful for the support. But when you look at the calendar, you have a conflict of interest. Some people are in the U.S., they want to move on. They want to move on to the elections and to finish with the war in Gaza. But we here in Israel, we cannot move on before we brought back the hostages before we finish the job. And finish the job means the eradication of Hamas completely. 
So that's where you have a conflict. And I think when you have an ally uh, like the US, we should be open about it and we should tell our colleagues in DC, we cannot stop, we will have to go all the way. And that's what we are going to do. We are willing to discuss the issues in RAPA, humanitarian aspects, uh, but at the end of the discussion, our colleagues should understand that we will not allow Hamas to win this war. It will be like the US in World War II invading Europe, paying a heavy price, but before getting to Berlin, getting Hitler and his leadership, stop the war and say, that's it. We're going back to the US. That's not how you win a war. All right. Well, the U.S. position is that uh, it, it, it doesn't come out and said not to invade Gaza, just there has to be some consideration. How do you say you were at the United Nations? You represented Israel there. Uh, Israel uh, getting a blow at the U.N. Uh, from the U.S. this past week. How, how serious do you assess it? There are some who are saying that the Netanyahu government is making too much of that uh, U.S. abstention. Uh, that was uh, unfortunate. You know, it reminded me of 2016. When I was in the Security Council, President Obama pushed a resolution against Israel, and the same idea of abstention, it's not a real abstention. Basically, the U.S. allowed the resolution to pass. And look what U.S. officials said a few weeks ago about similar resolution. They said, not us, that it's not going to help the negotiations of the release of the hostages. That's why they didn't support the resolution so far. So what changed in the last few days? I think there's a lot of pressure from the U.S., from other countries uh, in the U.N., uh, and that's why the, the U.S. came to that pressure. It was a mistake. I hope it will not be a sign for the future, because our enemies are already starting to send more resolution to the Security Council, and they think that they can stop us from the U.N., but they are, are a mistake. We are not stopping. We are going all the way uh, until we finish the job. There is one way for Israel not to operate in Rafa. If Hamas will surrender and release the hostages, then we have no interest to go into Alpha. But otherwise, we have no other choice. All right. And do I want to ask you, I do want to ask you the prime minister meeting today with the uh, parents of soldiers who have been captured uh, uh, in October 7th, taken hostage. Uh, they're demanding more action. It's unclear, different interpretations about whether there's any flexibility at all in Hamas's demands. Uh, how do you respond to those uh, parents of those uh, soldiers today saying they want to see a government be at least more proactive in somehow in reaching a hostage deal? You know, I, I meet many of the families, and I, I can completely understand uh, what they are take, talking about. Uh, and they are absolutely right. They want to see results. They want to see the boys and the girls back in Israel. It's the ongoing atrocities. We know about the tortures. We know what's happening to the hostages in Gaza. Uh, I think for us, it means that if we don't see a development in the negotiations in the next few days, we have to start the operation in Rafah. We have delayed it for a while, it was a mistake, and we have to continue with the same way we started the war, with full power in order to finish it. All right, uh, Danny Danone, Ambassador Danny Danone, uh, thank you for joining us this thank evening. Thank you very much, Colin. On I-24 News. And Mr. Ambassador Daniel Sheck, uh, as also a, a, another ambassador, I want to just get your response. Another ambassador to, and another Daniel. And another Daniel, yes. Uh, uh, your, uh, especially in terms of the, the breach between the U.S. Uh, uh, and Israel. Look, I can understand the uh, uh, certain amount of frustration with the, uh, with the role that the U.S. played in the Security Council. But it's, it's, uh, it's not the full truth to say that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, vetoed uh, the well, same. What did veto? They abstained. In the, yeah. No, no. Uh, he said that just a few weeks ago, oh, the right. U.S. had vetoed the same right. uh, resolution. It's not at all the same resolution. It's not the same resolution. There were resolutions coming from all sides, mm -hmm. including one pushed by the United States, which was vetoed by the Chinese and the Russians. Mm -hmm. And I think the U.S. wanted something to come out of the Security Council, uh, an agreed text. And they, water, they, they cut out many, many things. And we were left with actually a very short uh, text of a resolution right. with uh, very few action items. Um, 
without a direct correlation right. between uh, the uh, uh, pause in the in the fighting, fighting. not end of fighting, right. pause Plus. for the Ramadan, right. Right. and the uh, unequivocal uh, appeal or uh, demand for the unconditional and immediate release of all the hostages. Right. There's, it doesn't even speak about a deal. Right. Right. It's it's uh, unilateral. Right. So these two uh, things are not uh, textually related, but right. they are so juxtapositioned that you understand that one can't be without right. the other. And in the explanation that the US gave uh, for their vote, they said so uh, openly. Right. So this is, you know, I think now we're on the road to uh, renewing a more comfortable dialogue between uh, Jerusalem and, uh, Washington. and Washington. Uh, honestly, I don't see that in a moment of crisis, cutting uh, the dialogue uh, serves any purpose. Right. Well, suppose that presumably Prime Minister Netanyahu then yeah. uh, deciding so to he, send this Yeah, and, uh, you know, he, he went well, back on, on, on that, right, uh, you right. know, uh, gesture of anger, uh, very, very short, okay. very briefly, and and that was uh, the right move. All right, I want to stay focused on the U.S. for a moment, uh, because uh, let me point out that in the year 2000, Joe Lieberman, who has died yesterday at age 82, made history by becoming the first American Jew to run on the national ticket of a major political party. That's after Al Gore chose the uh, Democratic senator from Connecticut as his vice presidential running mate. Now, Lieberman and Gore, of course, lost that race, but just his selection for that candidacy, especially since he was a religiously observant Jew who proudly proclaimed and displayed his uh, faith in the public arena, did set a milestone in the acceptance of American Jewry in the U.S. mainstream. Uh, now, the centrist Democrat was also a strong backer of Israel. Uh, Liebman did break with his party and then President Obama to oppose the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in a statement today, called Lieberman an exemplary public servant, an American patriot, and a matchless champion of the Jewish people and Jewish state. Here is a segment of an interview Lieberman gave to I-24 News right on the eve of the 2020 U.S. election. I think uh, we have enough shared values, shared interests between Israel and the U.S. that if uh, Joe Biden is elected president, he and Prime Minister Netanyahu, U.S. and Israel, will continue to have very close relationships because uh, we are cut from the same cloth. We are both rule of law democracies, uh, and we have common interests, and unfortunately, we have uh, shared enemies, beginning with uh, Iran. Well, for more on Joe Liebman, let's go to our senior U.S. correspondent, uh, uh, Mike Wagenheim, joining us from New York. Kind of ironic to hear Senator Lieber, the late Senator Lieberman, talk about uh, his feelings about how the U.S.-Israel relationship will persevere in the Biden administration, uh, given the current tensions. Uh, but Joe Lieberman was one of a kind in his party, in U.S. politics, in many ways, uh, Mike. You know, it's uh, significant, Kalev. You mentioned uh, Lieberman was an opponent of the 2015 Iran nuclear accord. What other prominent Jew, the highest ranking elected official, uh, Jewish elected official in American history, also opposed to that was Chuck Schumer. Well, in a, what turned out to be a parting shot this week in an interview given uh, on national TV, Lieberman uh, called Schumer's comments uh, recently on the Israel U.S. relationship and on Israel's prosecution of the war in Hamas outrageous, is how Lieberman termed it. So even 10 years ago, less than that, uh, what was um, roundly uh, looked at as mainstream Jewish opinion, uh, sort of, on the, on the uh, state of American politics, even shifted lately in a sign that Lieberman never really diverged whatsoever from his principles, which drew him the uh, admiration of even people today like Chuck Schumer, like Barack Obama, uh, from all sides of the uh, political spectrum, Democrat and Republican, uh, a, a tip of the cap we're hearing uh, from just everybody imaginable involved in American politics from the last couple of decades, uh, really signifying a, a Lieberman in the way he was able to stick to his principles, but yet still do it in a gentlemanly way, in a statesmanlike fashion. Uh, just something that's been lost in American politics. Everybody going for the soundbite nowadays. Every 
everybody in a me, 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 look at me fashion. Lieberman was able to get it done in the Senate. He was able to champion what he thought um, were priorities. He was able to, to shift and shepherd them through the Senate and yet was able to do it in a, in a dignified way. And I, I think uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, people in American politics that are looked upon very highly uh, see Lieberman's passing as sort of a passing in American politics of the way, you know, the things used to be done in a quiet but efficient manner. Meanwhile, for Lieberman, uh, you know, the, just the paramount uh, Jew, an Orthodox Jew that made it further than anybody else has in that realm, I'm not really sure if we're going to see a, another like him. I mean, things have turned so much uh, in the way that any Jew is viewed right now in American life and American politics. Uh, it's, it's become so much harder at this point um, for, for somebody like a Lieberman to make a mark, to climb the ladder, to be looked upon as somebody who can have a, a, a positive impact with anti-Semitism just raining down now left and right. So in a lot of ways, his passing is a passing of um, sort of the, uh, the pinnacle of uh, American Jewry, especially within the political realm. Right. I just add, Mike, you know, if you look at both, uh, I would say certain elements, uh, not mainstream, but certain elements in both the Democratic and Republican parties uh, that are maybe fringe but so significant, you wonder if either of those parties would put a, a Jew, especially a, a proud and out Jew like Joe Liebman on a national ticket uh, in the near future. You have to wonder about that. But let's just appreciate uh, Joseph Lieberman for what he was, a politician and a mensch and a friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, may his memory be a blessing. Mike Wagenheim, thank you for that. Uh, let's stay focused for a minute on the U.S., especially on American campuses, where Jewish students or any supporter of Israel is increasingly finding themselves subjects of continuous hostility and harassment, both verbal, in some cases even physical. Now, long before the current wave of Jew baiting erupted following October 7th, the organization Stand With Us has been fighting anti-Semitism in American educational institutions, conducting leadership training and educational programs on hundreds of college campuses, high schools and middle schools, building support for Israel and combating Jew hatred. And joining us in studio now is the co-founder and CEO of Stand With Us, Roz Rothstein. Roz, thank you for joining us in thank studio. You. Thank you. for Pleasure having to have you here. Me. We've had you by uh, distance before. Before we get started on U.S. campuses, let's just, I'm not, something, maybe a word about Joe Lieberman, someone who was so, so so publicly and proudly spoke about his Jewishness. Uh, uh, and again, in the current atmosphere, uh, you, you, one has to wonder if uh, uh, how, how that would fare either in American politics or in, in the public sphere. It's, it's a tragic loss. I have met, I met him a couple of times. Uh, he was always pro-Israel and, um, and had uh, just had such a beautiful perspective on, on the Jewish people, the state of Israel, his wife Hadassah. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a terrible loss. Right. It really is. Well, let's talk about the uh, issue of the campuses, because uh, Stand With Us, as I said, I think 2000, in uh, 2000 it was founded, or 2001? 2001. One, and has been really fighting this fight, uh, even, say, w well before it almost became a public issue. So how do you assess uh, the current situation now for Jewish students? Well, certainly those that identify as such openly or are openly supportive of Israel, their situation on a lot of these campuses. Uh, it certainly was bubbling up since 2001. Uh, it's not a great big surprise that after October 7th, it just really exploded on far too many campuses. Uh, the students are complaining that they feel that they have to check their Zionism or their Judaism at the door uh, in order to be accepted, uh, that many things are happening that are discriminatory, actually discriminatory. Stand With Us has legal help for students, not just support for their uh, you know, ability to convey how they feel about Israel and, and be proud of their Judaism and proud of their Zionism, but also when, you know, st teachers, when, when they're professors or student groups on campus like Students for Justice in Palestine cross the line into discriminatory behavior and the administration at those campuses doesn't do anything about it, 
you know, we, we uh, may get involved and it may be actionable. Give us a specific example. And I know I think you began from Los Angeles or you're from from that area, but state of California, especially the area uh, around uh, Berkeley, has been particularly a hotbed of this. So maybe give us a, a sense on a specific campus how that may operate. There are a few cases already that we have filed, and so I can I can be specific there. Uh, uh, George Washington uh, University, In Washington, for example, DC. Washington D.C. Uh, a uh, a professor was actually discriminating against her Jewish and Israeli students. Uh, the, the, the students told the administration. The administration did nothing and uh, actually went back to the professor and informed her. And so it, matters got worse. And so the students came to us and, and we actually filed a complaint uh, with the Department of Education. Uh, there are a few cases like that where we file complaints on behalf of the students. And uh, Middlebury is another university. In Vermont, that, I believe. Is I, it? Yes. Or New Hampshire. But, and uh, MIT okay, right. has got problems. And how receptive do you find the school administration? Do you interface with them? And how, how, how receptive or not have you found them? We always try. We always try to find remedies where we speak to the administration, see if they're willing to, to listen, to change. Uh, but, but in some cases, in so many, in far too many cases, uh, the administration does not change and does not help the students. And the students are left, you know, with, with no support. And so uh, it's not on every campus. Sure, of course. But it's on far too many campuses. And professors are also, you know, guilty of, of discrimination. And, and when that happens, uh, you know, they're, they're going to hear in right. a legal way uh, from from right. us. Now, it started in the U.S., but I should mention it's been uh, stand with us, I think, a half dozen countries uh, active on, including even in Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So let's talk about the, what that says to do and what you're doing here in Israel now. Good question. Um, I came to Israel because I, I wanted to give a great big hug uh, to Israelis and to victims of terrorism sure. and for everything that's going on right now. Uh, it's heartbreaking. And um, what I heard and what really motivated me to come this month is that many Israelis feel that um, people, even if they care, they care less mm -hmm. or people don't care anymore. Uh, or, you know, uh, the comments that, that many of our staff are receiving is, you know, you mean people still think about us? You mean people still care about us? And I want to say that, yes, they do, very much so. Uh, and, and people like me and, and people around the world connected to stand with us. And by the way, we're on six continents now. Okay. So we're, we are, we have grown a lot. Right. Okay. Um, we we care so deeply. We've actually had 1.5 billion interactions on our right. social media platforms. I mean, it's 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 big, and I wanted to convey that, and that's really why I'm here. Seeing you know people who have lost members of their sure. families, who have survived the atrocities of October 7th, who are displaced. Uh, you know, that's that's why I'm here. All right. Uh, Roz Rothstein, co-founder, CEO of Stand With Us, a, a, an organization that was well of ahead of the trend, unfortunately, one might unfortunately, say. Unfortunately. But certainly exactly. you have your work cut out for, for, you, for you more than ever. Roz, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having news. me. Thank you. Well, let's bring the focus back to Israel now uh, and take up the question uh, of whether the ultra-Orthodox religious sector, called in Hebrew the Haredim, should receive a full exemption from Israel's mandatory military draft. Now, this has been a long debate, uh, a, a, a debate of long simmering controversy. But since October 7th and the pressing demand for more manpower in the IDF, it's become a critical political issue. Today, the government requested more time from the Supreme Court to resolve the matter. But there are no easy solutions for Prime Minister Netanyahu. His own defense minister says he won't support extending the service period for regular army and reservist troops unless the whole government supports uh, a, a solution to the uh, Haredi enlistment issue. Uh, ben, Benny Gantz, member of the War Cabinet, insisting the ultra-Orthodox must agree to serve in the army some way. He today released a statement saying, quote, 
We tried to explain after October 7th, the ultra-Orthodox society must understand that something has changed. We have the opportunity for a historical correction, which will strengthen us now in the war. Unfortunately, we couldn't come to an agreement between us and Bridge the Gaps, and I still hope it's not too late, but I will not give my hand to suggestions aimed at bypassing the high court and not to meet the needs of the IDF and the Israeli society. As I have said repeatedly for a long time, recruitment solutions, yes. Exemptions from recruitment, no. Well, meanwhile, here's what Knesset member Moshe Gaffney of the ultra-Orthodox United Torah Judaism Party had to say today on the issue. After 2,000 years of exile, the people of Israel returned to become a Jewish people. We returned to our land. We returned to Tiberias and because of Torah students who study Torah and continue the tradition. I bless the soldiers who risk their lives in Gaza and here on the northern border facing Hezbollah. I pray with all the people of Israel that they return home safe and sound, but without Torah students, we have no future, and so we have to safeguard them. Raphael, a former uh, officer in the IDF. Uh, I should note this uh, high court uh, did issue a, uh, a interim uh, a ruling telling the government if it does not solve this situation by April 1st, uh, it will order that funding be cut off for all religious uh, seminaries, yeshivot, uh, that do not, uh, whose uh, students do not uh, uh, serve or are willing to serve. Uh, the question is well, how the government gets out of it and what it should be doing. First of all, the Israeli government has shown tonight by postponing uh, the meeting of the cabinet that is more interested in its own survival, political survival, than in the security of the country. Uh, the problem of uh, whether or not to enlist uh, religious uh, Torah studying uh, people is not a political problem, not a moral problem. It's a real security issue. We need, we are short of soldiers. We need everybody to help uh, to join the army. Uh, it's not normal that only a uh, part of uh, the Israeli citizens should bear the burden. So that's uh, a absolute security need. Uh, political and religious uh, things left aside. We must remember that out of the 60,000 uh, so-called Torah uh, studying uh, people that are involved, uh, more than 30,000 are not studying Torah at all. Right. Uh, it's a trick. It's a trick to escape uh, the military. It's a trick to avoid working, not just uh, avoiding the military. And I will remind uh, right. very humbly that the biggest mitzvah that a Jew can perform in, as a Jew is the defending the land, the holy land of Israel and the Israeli and the Jewish people. All right. Uh, I just want to quickly go back to uh, Daniel Sheck. There's yeah. some uh, comment from that meeting. Yeah, the so the, the meeting the ended and the families uh, uh, spoke up. Uh, the bottom line is that they were disappointed by the meeting. They had heard nothing uh, uh, new and uh, they pointed out to him, especially uh, Ruby Chen, the father of uh, Itai Chen, who was declared uh, dead, unfortunately. Uh, just uh, a while ago, he said uh, that national security uh, is also, uh, uh, I mean, it's not just a military notion, it's also social cohesion has, is, a, is a component of national security. And what would happen to social cohesion if uh, uh, parents, families of soldiers uh, weren't certain that uh, the 